what we're going to talk about. Today, we're going to talk about, and when I say we, I mean all of you guys that are out there that won't show me your faces, I see names, no faces, all of you guys are going to talk with me. But there come some people, thank you. Thank you for keeping me from talking to a black screen. There you go, Laura, that's great. Today we're going to talk about, you know, the CDC has extended the moratorium. They said one more time. For the most part, the people that we have um, polled in the assisted housing are not having trouble with a whole lot of residents who are behind on their rent. However, a lot of them are discovering that their residents are in business. How many of you um, have residents that receive the PPE loans? So those are the things that we're going to talk about today. Um, There's a question, there was a poll, I don't know how many of you are on LinkedIn, but there was a poll on LinkedIn that asked, how many of you think this is going to be the last time? I sincerely believe that this is going to be the last time. I don't think that the administration can continue to go through what they're going through. But then what does it involve? It involves maybe on our end, having more residents to come and apply. On the conventional end, more people being displaced. So I wanna know what you guys think about. Who wants to talk to me this morning? And then there was silence. Nobody wants to talk. Nobody has a thought. Ebony put up the poll. How many of you um, have residents who receive PPP loans that you know of? PPP, PPE, any of those? None of you? Hmm, okay. I see a hand, Rose. Will, are you saying you had one? I have several. Um, I have one that is trying to fight. He said that it was done her. Her identity was at and she didn't get the money, but they use her address here. When you go in online and look at it, it shows our address here that that's where they sent the money. So um, she's trying to deny it. I have one that said that she uh, didn't get the money. She applied, but because she only had cash out and didn't have a bank account, they didn't give her the money. You can't prove it whether or not she got the money or not. Yeah. And then her there, name did show up on the list. Her name showed up on the list and the business, she said that there was a guy in Memphis that had a business that she went up under to get the money. Mm. Okay. So, uh, I, I mean, everybody that I talked to out here that has gotten it, they went through somebody else's business to get the money. Mm. Um, I had about three emails from three different managers, and one of them was similar to yours. She says, well, how do we prove that it's not her? Well, number one, I told her that if it's not her resident, then, and somebody has stolen her resident's identity, that's a serious thing, that she should report that to the authorities to let them know that somebody has her uh, identity. It's a form of identity theft. And the loan might not be the only place that they stop. You know, they might create credit accounts, credit cards, all of those things in her name. So that's one thing. The other thing is that loans, as you know, when we're counting income, are not actually counted as income because they have to be what? Paid back. They are indeed loans. However, we're more interested in, did you have a business? And what was the profit and loss of that business? Did you have income from that business? 
And that's what we're more interested in, and I think they know it. So they're trying to hide it, as you said, in uh, other accounts. One lady that uh, sent in an email, she said that um, their address was given to as a business address. Well, something tells me that the government will eventually catch up with all of this. And so, like I say, that's really the loan is really not our concern. Our concern is whether or not there was income that came from that business if the resident has unreported income. So getting to that, I came out with a little letter and an incidental business questionnaire. Now, um, there's another manager that sent me some questions for the business questionnaire. So if you all are interested, um, we'll get it to you. Just let us know. The uh, questionnaire just basically asks, what's the name of your business, the business address, just trying to get them to thinking. So according to the poll, 33% of you did have and 45% didn't and 22% still don't know. Thank you, Ebony, for that. That's really interesting. Now, what do you all think about the moratorium coming to an end in July? Now, before we get to discussing that, I'm gonna ask you to think about these things. Number one, make sure that your waiting list is updated, okay? Number two, you might have a lot of residents that come your way or now will have to have affordable housing through the method of assisted housing. And I don't know how many of you have been in the business a good little while. I'm not going to say a long time because, you know, I'm still dying this hair and stuff. But a good little while. Remember that when we had the, the, the layoff and the, the run of the economy years ago, our industry changed. We received a lot more people who had been in conventional housing, who were educated and savvy, that had to apply for affordable housing through our program. So make sure that you have done your waiting list. Well, Vicki, what do we do to the waiting list? Let's go ahead and purge our waiting list. Let's get it up to date. Let's find out how many of those 200 names that are on that list have found housing or are no longer interested in housing. Let's consolidate our waiting list. Let's update our application package. Update it how? Make sure that you have all of the current things. And if you've had a recent MOR, I'm sure you've updated it. Let's make sure that you have all of the current questions on the waiting list. Make sure you have that little disclosure for the social security number, you know, those two exemptions. And let's get ready to see if we do have people that will be coming to apply on our side. I'm expecting a lot of foreclosures. I've talked to a couple of investors and they are gathering their money because they're looking to buy a lot of foreclosures because they're thinking that the market is just going to be flooded with foreclosures. And then that brings us to the humanity part. Um, remember that a lot of what's happening is not the fault of the applicant or the resident. It's the fault of the pandemic. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. I had a call from a resident complaint. There were three residents at this property and they were able to seek vouchers to keep from being evicted. And the manager won't even sign off on the vouchers. She told them that, and get this y'all, I referred them to a uh, fair housing person, but she told them that they had to pay her $3,000 to get out of their lease. Can you imagine anybody in today's time doing that? She told them that their lease goes a complete year and that they would owe the balance on their lease. Now, we all know that the initial lease, the initial lease is one year. And after that, the leases go month to month. 
when I told these young ladies that, they said, oh, no, that's not what Miss So-and-so says. She says, I have six months on my lease, and I've got to pay all of that rent, including the hood part. So if you all know people who are doing this or associated with people, straighten them. If you have residents that don't know, inform them. We want informed residents because we want to stay in compliance. We don't want your management company's name posted across the internet on LinkedIn and Facebook and all of those other social medias. So let's see, here's our poll. Let's see the poll, the results of the poll on evictions and what you think. Okay. Your waiting list, 75% have updated it. That's great. No no's. Okay. We've got 25% that are working on it. Great. Didn't we have a poll out there, Ebony, for uh, evictions? What's the question that you want to ask? I thought we had one out there. If anyone had a lot of evictions or they had residents. Oh, no, I don't have that one. I can ask that one, though. Okay, let's ask. Let's ask how many uh, of our residents, current residents, will be involved in the evictions. I know I had an email about two weeks ago, and um, she asked me, well, what's the, what's the 411 on evictions? And like I told her, it was supposed to end the end of June, but now we're at the end of July. And in case you all did not know it, or if you did not see our post in LinkedIn, the our SAMA, which is a industry partner, has a similar partner in Connecticut, and they gave a free webinar on you know, the evictions and on the moratorium coming to an end and what you should do. And so it's something to think about. It's something to think about. Having a lot of vacancies is always something to think about. Okay. Um, I want to hear from you. What do you all think about the extension of the moratorium? And do you think that it's going to be the end? Mary Ross also has a session that she's doing on what to do toward the end of the um, moratorium. They were expecting the eviction moratorium to end on the end of June, June the 30th. But as you know, as I said before, it's been extended for those who might've just tuned in to July the 31st. I'd like to caution you to also not only get your waiting list together and get your information together for your evictions, if you have any, but also we have a new, it's not really a new strand of a COVID, but it's called the Delta. And this morning when I was listening to the news, they said that the Delta virus is spreading in the United States. Now, I hope that it doesn't spread to the extent that we have to go on lockdown again. I don't think anybody's ready for another lockdown. I know that I'm not, but we do want to be cautious. So what I want to ask you and to remind you is something similar if you took Mary's class to what Mary said. We have a new entity to our industry, and that was the pandemic. So we always have to be on guard for what we're going to do in the future if this happens to us again. And so you need to think about your rules, your regulations. Um, the CDC is asking you to continue to wear a mask and stay X number of feet apart, especially if you're in a large group. Now, there are some people who don't like masks. There are some people who um, have been on airlines and they have been had to be put off the plane. They've been given long findings and what have you. Uh, when I say long findings, expensive findings in terms of 
cut nut on the airplane. And I know that you all have seen this. So in our industry, we want to be aware. We want to be aware of what's happening. So how can I hear from some of you? Let's let you talk. What do you think? What do you think we headed? What are you doing to help that might help everybody else? Evan has put our poll up. How many current residents are involved in evictions? Uh, seven to eight percent say you have one to five. Okay. Twenty-two percent say none, and that's good. So don't forget um, that you need to go by the forty-three fifty. Don't forget about your terminations that are in there. Don't forget how you serve the termination of assistance and the termination of occupancy, or tenancy, they call it in the handbook. So who wants to talk? Who wants to talk about your property and what you're doing to, um, for the future? In case Delta catches us. I had a lady yesterday tell me, well, Vicki, you better go while you can because we'll probably be locked up again in December. I said, say it's not so. Say it's not so. I don't want to be locked up anymore. I want to get out and visit and go to the States and see the people. Okay, not everyone talk at once. <laughs> um, let's see. William Scott says that they have zero evictions. He just posted that. Okay, that's great, William. So my question is, um, for those who have had no evictions, how have your residents been able to keep up with their rent? Um, are they still working? What was going on with them? Did they get support from the state or the CARES Act funds? How did they keep on top of their rent? And again, silence. One of the things, I'll talk. About, go ahead. Hi, hi, this is Lara. Um, I was working in Rhode Island and we had a couple of residents who had fallen behind. Um, some of them had said that it was a decrease in income because of the pandemic, but then they applied for state assistance and were denied. Um, so anybody that we did take to court because they were delinquent, the court said, go back, have them apply for assistance. If they're denied, then we can proceed with the eviction. And if they were not denied, then obviously we had to work with them. But in Rhode Island, it was very difficult for people to get any assistance. I think I only had maybe one resident out of five who applied for it, who actually were approved for the assistance. But everybody what, else. Do you know what the problem was, Laura? No, I, I think it was just difficult. And actually, the a couple, we had um, Safe Harbor initially, and then I can't remember the name of the second one, but you couldn't even get on the website to apply as a landlord or as a resident. Um, they just said, we're closed. We're not accepting any more applications. So probably about maybe 30 to 45 days ago, they opened up an additional funding. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I can't, I, the name of it is just... I can't think of it right now, but um, so we really didn't have too many, but everybody else who did have a decrease in their job income, we just did an IR for them and, you know, lowered their rent and that made a big difference. But we found at the very beginning, people were not telling us that they lost their job because they were getting that additional unemployment. I and I think they thought that we were going to include that. And so they didn't want to tell us. So we didn't find out, you know, until six months or something when we're doing their AR. Um, but other than that, you know, most people were able to kind of keep up. We, I think we were very lucky, but it seems from the poll that everybody's in better shape than what we would expect. Yes, it does. It really does. And thank you for that. Um, I tried to reach the people in Birmingham. Our state agency was in charge of distributing the funds. And I tried to reach the people uh, locally in our city to find out how it was going. I talked to a couple of managers and they said the same thing that you said, Laura, that um, a lot of the residents were having trouble getting the funds. And one of their reasons were, was that the residents were not um, computer savvy. 
Some of them didn't even have computers. So they had to go down to the agencies and apply. And when they went down to the agencies, I don't think the agencies were set up because you know this all happened so fast that the agency wasn't set up to walk them step by step through the process. But I'm told now that the agencies have become a lot more client friendly, customer oriented, that they're allowing them to come down and they're walking them through the steps. Um, it's amazing how no one thought about that in the beginning, because if they don't know the information to put in, they might put it in wrong. I listened to a webinar yesterday on the National Apartment Association. And that gentleman was saying, and you know, they have filed suit in the courts to do away with the moratorium. They were saying that it was illegal in the first place. And so they are, they have a lot of conventional properties that are not receiving rents and it's causing havoc on the owners and the management companies. And he was saying that a lot of the residents don't know exactly what to do or how to do it. And there's a question as to whether or not the owners of the properties will accept a direct payment, the payment is paid directly to them. And I think the residents got kind of confused thinking that if they check that, that they would get um, the management company would get the money and they wouldn't. So they were not checking that. Consequently, they weren't getting funded because maybe the residents thought it was like the stimulus checks. If we don't check that, we'll get this money, but it doesn't work that way. So um, I have seen on the television where they have had explanations of the vaccine, why it's important to get the vaccine. I thought to myself, they need explanations as to how to apply for this rental assistance and how important it is to the landlords because the landlords did still have taxes. They did still have insurance to pay. They did still have upkeep of the unit. So they need those delinquent funds. Hey, Vicki. Yes. We have a couple of comments. Okay. Um, uh, Molly from Westgate said that tenants who had gotten behind have moved before the stay on ev evictions ended because they felt like they could never get caught up and didn't want an eviction on their record. So that's one comment. Thank okay. you for that. Um, the next one uh, from M. Tinsley says, our organization had an internal rent relief program, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And the state of Connecticut also had two temporary rent assistance programs that is offering up to $15,000. For the subsidized residents, they could get assistance with their portion. And then William Scott says that we are a senior housing facility and there is a critical housing shortage. 98% are extremely low income receiving HUB, HUD subsidy. They are on social security and or disability. Oh, those are great comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you guys for that. Um, that's interesting about the states also uh, coming in and helping out. I think that that is a great thing. And I think that um, if you check with your state, you might find some other resources. Uh, I was talking to our CEO this morning and she was saying that she found out that the United Way and the Continuum of Care had some funds and that they were actually helping out also. So you might want to check around and see who has what. Any other comments? I'm going to put a link in the chat for our page on rental assistance programs that are available. Okay. When I was listening on, on the webinar yesterday, it also uh, brought to mind that our industry is a unique one. And Laura, I, I, I think that your company is doing an excellent job in trying to do the IRs when there's a lack of income. And sometimes we don't reach out far enough. 
And this is our industry, this is our livelihood. So we need to reach out to do whatever we can do to help to keep those units filled. Now, my experience as a manager, I hated vacant units. My experience as a regional, I hated vacant units. Somehow or the other, the children would always find a rock. And I think they just love the pop of the glass. So when you have vacant units, you have people who not knowingly destroying them, but are actually destroying them. So it costs you more to have a vacant unit than it does to have an occupied unit. Yes. Um, also, you mentioned a good point in terms of the unemployment. We have a lot of citizens who are holding out for the extension of unemployment. But guys, I think it's gone. I, I think it's gone. I think we're at the end of that. There are help wanted signs everywhere. Another seminar I set in on yesterday was saying that um, opposed to a bailout, that the unemployment or that the, uh, what is it, that the What's the word I'm looking for now? That the system, the unemployment system should have offered something and that minimum wage should have been raised. I think that a lot of companies realize that $7.50 with the cost of living being where it is, is not a lot. And some of them have elected themselves to increase their minimum wage to uh, I think anywhere between 12 and $15. But it's gonna be interesting in seeing what happens there also. And next week or the end of this week, they're supposed to come out with how many new jobs have been posted and where we're going for the future. I'm going to encourage you to look at your new hires report for EIV. There are some management companies who pulled the EIB new hire report quarterly because that's what the suggestion was in the EIB information that we received from HUD. But just like the VAWA addendum, it was just a suggestion. So uh, you might want to look and see if that's helping you. I know that if I were managing now, my new hire report would be pulled monthly. I wouldn't wait till the end of the quarter, going into the fourth or fifth month to argue with a resident about why they had amnesia and forgot to come in to tell me that they were working. It's a lot easier to stay ahead of the game than it is to play catch up. So if you are one of those companies, that's something that you might want to consider. I think we have a few more comments coming in. Okay, let's hear them. Uh, from Lawana at Knollwood. She says she's always found that local churches are willing to help with rent for my senior adults if they get behind. Okay. And Debbie Pearson at Medical Center Terra says we were fortunate that several organizations offered their services for our seniors. Oh, great, great. Um, yesterday I was looking and there was another company that hosted a food drive. Uh, and I thought that that was great too. Um, seniors, usually you don't have to worry about because they received Social Security and it was still there, but they do have other expenses. And if their parents, they feel like they have other obligations to help their children and their grandchildren out. So it's quite easy for them to get behind too. I know I had a call from a senior property and the manager didn't understand how the resident couldn't pay her rent and she was receiving Social Security because Social Security was not affected with the, um, the job shortage, the layoffs, the unemployment. But I asked, I said, well, have you talked to her to ask her why? She says, well, she has an appointment here today. And I asked her if she would to let me know. And I appreciate you all letting me know what happens on your property so that I could share it. And it comes to find out 
that the daughter who had been working two jobs was no longer working. She was receiving unemployment, but she had four children. And the grandmother felt it was her responsibility to help her with those kids. So she got behind. Which brings to that something else. Now we're beginning to get into a stage where the residents of children are being offered a, what are they calling it? A tax break, I'm gonna call it a tax break for the lack of, where they are letting you claim the children and take a tax break. And this is happening at one of our family properties and on the family property, it's the aunt that has the children. And the manager, it was a, the aunt that called in and said the manager wants proof that she has custody of these children. She has her children's, her sister's children and her sister is on drugs in the street, homeless, and she took the children. Well, the handbook says in chapter five, that we don't have to have proof any longer. So keep that in mind. If you were in the business 40 years ago, like I was, as a industry practice, we asked for proof that you actually had custody of these children and the children were in your custody before we give you the $480 allowance. When they came out with the last revision of the 4350, they said that's no longer necessary. So keep in mind that a lot of people are struggling. And my concern is that if the aunt didn't take these children, where would they be? Also, if you've been watching the fair housing, the different fair housing tips, they're talking about how some of the grandparents are having to take the children. And the managers and regionals of the 202 properties are literally having a fit. But be careful about how you treat the children. It could come out to be a huge fair housing complaint against you. Which brings up something else that's new in our industry. It's not really new. But how many of you read the Fair Housing uh, or subscribed to a Fair Housing newsletter and heard about the wife who went to keep the husband as a living aide? It seems like they were separated, but not divorced. And the management company refused to let her come in as a living aide. Remember, a living aide can be a family member, but it can't necessarily be a already existing household member. And the manager was confused because he or she was saying that the lady was married to the gentleman, but she lived in Puerto Rico and he lived here. They went to court, the court sided with her. And we'll try to post that out there too, because I think it's really interesting to, uh, to read and to keep up with these things. Comments, who has a comment? Who has something they want to share? Who's doing something different on their property that they feel may benefit another property? Ms. Vicki, we don't wanna talk. We want you to give out a breath. We just want you to talk, talk, talk. Is that what y'all telling me? <laughs> Nobody has anything to say. Everybody's all good. I got a question. Okay. Uh, I was reading when the article came out about the um, the extension on the uh, eviction. Yes. But it also said when you read down off in there about 30 day eviction notice requirement that uh, we have to give 30 day notice now before we can be a bid for non-payment? Yes. Could you explain what they're actually saying there? What they're actually saying is that like the moratorium has moved it to July the 31st, that's the end. 
before you can evict them, you have to give them 30 day notice. And that's what the handbook says, that they're being evicted. And you give them the reason. So you actually just follow the procedures in the handbook. There were some companies, and I'm sure you all might have read about them or heard about them. They were given seven day notices and evicted. You have to give the people 30 day notice. You might have seen the people in Texas that were only giving seven days and then they were having the sheriff to go out and set the people out. Did any of you all see any of that news on the news? So they're letting us know that you still have to give a 30 day notice. A manager called and she says, well, it ends on, at this time, it was supposed to be June the 30th, but I still can't do anything with them until July the 30th, because I have to give them that 30 day notice. So basically it ends now on July the 31st, but you still can't do your wits with the sheriff and what have you in court until you give them the 30 day notice. And it could be like whoever said that their residents began to move out we talked earlier, oh, I think about four or five months ago, that if you have some residents, you might want to offer them a payment plan. Now, do they skip out on the middle of these payment plans, even when you have an EIV payment plan? Yes, they do. Does the multifamily industry need something like the public housing industry so that you'll know who left on when they apply? You can go into a system similar to EIV and know what's left owing to the previous management company. That would help us a lot with new applicants coming in. But to answer your question, you do have to give them a 30 day notice. Now, that brings up another thing that I read. How many courts in your particular areas, in your district are behind? So I have been reading the court systems are behind. So even though you have to the 31st of July, and then you have the 30 day letter, before you get an answer from the court, it might take an additional 20, 30 days because the court systems are behind. And can you imagine all of the management companies who are waiting, they're just waiting, they're mad. Like I said, the uh, apartment association, they're truly upset that this has gone on so long. So the court systems are gonna be flooded also. So that might be another delay, but you go ahead and you do your due process because evictions are a due process. I had one manager in a discussion that felt no pity, she says, for residents because they received the stimulus check. And if they were truly interested in catching up on their rent, they would have bought a part or all of that stimulus check in here, Vicki, but they weren't interested. And now I'm supposed to have sympathy? Well, to me, that's a poor way to look at it, but that is true. They did receive their stimulus checks. Now we all know that if you've been in this business any time, there are people who woke up in our units this morning trying to figure out a way to get over, right? That's, that, that's typical of some people. But there were also residents who woke up this morning praying for another way. So you just have to, to weigh the balance and learn to live with yourself. The, um, the other thing about, like I said, having vacancies is it's like a vacant house. Things start going down when a house stays vacant too long. Have you ever seen a vacant house just sit there and things start deteriorating? The elements from the outside, the rain, the cold, the sun, the snow, all of that affects what's happening on the inside. So that's something you might want to think about too. Do we have any other comments? No? I have a question, Vicki. Okay. Um, if we change the, if we have in our EIB policies and procedures to pull the new hires report quarterly, 
and we want to do it on a monthly basis, temporarily maybe, mm -hmm. do we need to change our policies and procedures to reflect that before we put that in place? Very good question. Very good question. Yes, you do. You need to update your policies and procedures to say monthly opposed to quarterly. And there's nothing in the guidelines that said that you cannot, you don't have to have it approved by anyone. And there's nothing in the guidelines that say you can't go back. It's really, remember, EIV was meant to, to help us and to help the residents. So if you do, by all means, you have to put it in your EIV policies and procedures. When you have an MOR and they come to check your book, if they see that the report is poor monthly, but your policy says quarterly, they're going to give you a finding. And some of you are un under navigate and some of you are not, but the system works the same regardless. So yes, that's a very good question. Very good question. Make sure that you do update your policies and procedures either way you go so that you won't receive a finding for it. And let's say this is, you do it effective July the 1st and you change your policies and procedures and you have an MOR and the contract administrator or HUD comes in and they check it and they check a file from May. May you were on the quarter. They will see, keep your old policy, keep your old policy so that you'll have proof that this is what we were doing then. Now we've updated and your updated date should be a part of your new policy. That's a very good question. That's one I should have mentioned. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay. Now, I have something for you guys. I've tried to, because y'all won't talk to me and talk back to me, I've tried to line some things up. What um, next live Tuesday tip in July, I'm asking the RMs, those are the people who come out to your property, like we had the CACs, I've asked the uh, RMs to join us and they can let us know about systematic problems that they're seeing since they are the feet on the ground. I've talked to one of our fair housing advocates here in Birmingham and she's going to come over and she's going to uh, do a live interview. That will probably be September. Um, I need to know from you and Ebony, I guess, can put up something what topics you'd like to see? Who would you like to have in? Um, I've talked to someone from Social Security because as you know, if you have a senior property, Social Security has all of these codes. What do these codes mean? Are the Social Security, we know from EIB that people receive Social Security but it's not shown in EIB, and why is that? And most of the time it's because they're not drawing their own social security, they're drawing social security from someone else. So that's something to consider. I, I wanna make this interesting to you, but also want to make it meaningful to you, you know, cause you all take those um, Tuesday tip live hour, and you put it aside. So we want to gain something and we want to learn something. So if you'll let us know, you can email me at dbell at navigatehousing.com. That's V for Vicki, bell at navigatehousing.com. Or you can send something to the marketing department, Ebony and Chris. I don't see Chris's face. Let me introduce you to a new person on the marketing team. Chris, where are you? I am right here. This is Chris Shirley, guys. This, uh, he and Ebony are in charge of marketing. And you might have remembered the little fellow we had before, Charlie. Chris has taken Charlie's place. So you'll see his face on a couple of tips, too. We've got to get him out there, but he's been doing a marvelous job. 
He's shy. Okay. <laughs> Is there anybody else or anything else that you want to discuss? You're going to send me that. You're going to help me out. You're going to help me keep my job by sending me some topics and things that we want to discuss. I love y'all. I know y'all love me. So send me something. Any other comments? Uh, we've got a few here. They want to hear about MOR common findings, how to report repayment agreements on vouchers. Uh, Laura, thank you. She says she loves Tuesday tips. Thank you, Laura. Um, so let's see what else. Did I say income discrepancies already? Nope, you did say income discrepancy. Okay, we'll talk about some of those things. Now, during the regular Tuesdays, we're giving three tips about findings on MORs. And then we'll cultivate uh, probably sometime in August. And um, I have, I want to tell you this, regardless to whether Navigate is your contract administrator or not, all contract administrators are to do a close out with you at the end of your MOR. They're to discuss with you the findings that are there to let you know what they found, to see if they overlooked something or something's just missing. Now I say this because a lot of times you might be in a hurry as managers and then you'll send an appeal. When we get appeal letters, I really don't understand them. They say that I, I don't think we should have an appeal of such and such. We, you can only appeal a below average and an unsat. Satisfactory, above average and superior. Remember, they don't have an appeal component to them. You can only appeal an unsat and a below average. Now, when I get these letters, they're saying we had A, B, C, X, Y, Z. The RM or whoever did your review, the reviewer should have asked you to look at this finding before they left property and given you the opportunity to produce the 30 day letter or to produce the um, 120 day letter or whatever it is the finding might have been on. So if they come, any reviewer from any contract, it's a part of our contract. We have to do an exit interview with you. And that's to go over the findings. So if you find this information, uh, I did an MOR last month. I wrote the finding for the 120 day letter being missing from the file. When we went through the exit interview, she says, oh, I have it. I just have a file that is in that pile over there to be filed. Can I put it in there? And of course I said, yes, all I want to do is see it on the day of the review to know that it is there and you did not overlook it. So she put it in the file and I took that finding off of her report. So remember that, uh, make sure you have an exit interview don't be in too big of a hurry as a manager. I had one lady who sent in an appeal and she says, well, he tried to go over that information with me, but I had to go get my child from daycare. Well, that's understandable. That is understandable, but you can't turn around and say, well, I want to appeal this because I had it and it wasn't produced the day of. So keep that in mind. Let's see what our poll says. Can y'all see this? Social security, 70%, fair housing, 70%. Relationship management. Not sure exactly what that one is. Oh, relationship managers that you were talking about. Oh, relationship <laughs> managers, okay. Income discrepancy. Uh, marketing, very good. Repayment agreement, very good. How to report repayment agreements on the vouchers. Okay, we'll get Deanna in to do a session on that and the common MOR findings. Great. Um, also, um, A. Wilson said that she wanted someone to explain EIV income reports. Okay. 
And I've written all of those down. Okay. Um, also, we have two questions. Lawana says, may I ask a question about a fire door today, react, or do I need to send it in as a future topic? Do you want an answer today or do you, let's just take it today. What do you want to know about the fire door? It is on the react schedule and it does have to, you know, the, the fire door has to be open and the fire door has to penetrate, be able to penetrate heat up to a certain degree. Is that what you're talking about? No, actually, um, the fire doors we have go to the entrance of our resident apartments that I'm talking about. Okay. And as you know, they bump them and that type of thing. And I did look this up to hopefully come up with my own answer. But you know how you have the guards that you can put on a door? Yes. Um, that the way that I understood it, it was like 16 inches and below. I guess the question, am I allowed to put a guard at the bottom of a fire door, which I think that I can, as long as it's below 16 inches, but I didn't want to do anything. I wasn't supposed to. Let me do this. You know, I won't tell you anything I don't know, but as a former REACT inspector, you've got to have that space at the bottom for the air. Right. Yes. And I don't know, since they are revising, we're still under our old REACT inspection until Inspire comes out. But let me see if there is, if you'll leave us with your email address, let me see if there is something that's changed. Okay. Since I did them. And I'll let you know. Okay, that's thank you, Vicki. Yeah. I do know that um, the doorways from the wheelchairs and the hallways, have you ever gone down the hallways that get scratched from the, the walls get scratched from the wheelchair? And when the inspector goes in, according to how deep the scratch is, you know, he, he looks at it and, and that type of thing. But I will let you know. And that's a good question because we have a lady who called um, last week a resident and she's upset because they, the elderly property had a trash dump. You know where you take the garbage and you put it in a chute and it goes all the way down to the basement? They have cut the chute out. Management has closed the chute and they have put in what they call a trash room now. And they put a garbage can uh, on the floor and the residents have to bring their garbage to it. The resident was saying that this is beginning to be a rodent problem because most people don't put it into the can and that there's only one can. So when I looked at the house rules, they did change their house rules from shoot to trash room. When I read the house rules, it said that it would be, the room would be clean, the trash would be emptied twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. Well, the resident brought up a good question. She says, well, Miss Bell, there's no one to do that here on the weekend. So that's when the majority of the trash hits the floor. So I put in a call to them to see what they can, can do to help. I also asked, uh, the gentleman won't be in until today. He gets back from vacation today, uh, the regional. But I asked the little manager to answer the phone and she said that they have one can, she did admit that they had one can for this room. So my next question was, how many residents do you have on the floor? She says, 33. That's a lot of residents for one trash can. I would think, you know, just, just me thinking. But I'll find out what he says today. Hey, Vicky. No problem. We have another question. You I'm sorry, Ebony. I thought someone else was asking a question. Um, but we do have uh, Laura's asking, are we doing MORs in person or remotely? Navigate, went through the pandemic, doing them in person. So hats off to our staff. They did them in person, not remotely. There are some contract administrators who are doing them remotely though. 
uh, so I've been told. Um, HUD said that we had to find out how the physical part of the property looked, so they're taking the files remotely. The management companies are sending them the files, I think, and then they just go out and take a view of the physical outside of the property and the common areas. But during the pandemic, most of the common areas were not being used. But yet our people have been on the ground during the whole pandemic. And I just put a link for everyone. This was our MOR protocol that we used during the pandemic. So you can take a look at that if you want to. Now, let me ask you all a, a good question, a fair question. Ebony puts a lot of stuff out there on those links for you all to use. Let's get a poll. Let's get a poll, Ebony. How many people use the links and how many people don't? How many people would rather see something come to their email box? Now, I might be out of place because I don't send the emails. So that's Ebony and Chris's department. They might say, oh, no, Ms. Vicky, you don't got us in trouble. That's too many emails to send. But how many people would rather have something that comes to their email box opposed to you thinking, mm, I forgot to go out there. I know they said it was going to be out there, but I forgot to go out there. We got a poll going up, Ebony? No, see, she, she said, she said, there's a poll, but she can, I can tell she's not liking it. <laughs> no, it's not that. I was just trying to, it's a, it was a twofold question. So um, let me add another question too. And this is just so that ever since, this is my 20th year here at Navigate. You know, we were Jeff Co before. Ever since I started, the CEO then and the CEO now have always pushed us to do great customer service. So if us putting the links out there isn't a service to you, we want to serve you in the best way possible. Okay. Because sometimes after these uh, Zoom calls, I, I bet you today I get at least three emails I didn't want to ask. But could you tell me such and such a thing? So we love service. How many of you use the links in Zoom? Okay, 80%. Well, great. Great, Ebony. That is good. And we have this one that you can take part in. Because what we can do is once I put today's live video together, the links that were shared, I can definitely add those into the email for you. Okay. So, so far, says 100% say yes to the email. See, they're like me. I can click in my box and have it. I, it'll go past me with all I have to do to think about, mm, I should have looked at that. Okay, so our marketing department has a new feature for you. Let's give them a hand. They're, they're so good. Ebony and Chris do a wonderful job. I don't know, I can't pick up a social media forum and I'm not on Facebook, but my husband is. He says, there's Navigate again. Navigate has them out there on Facebook. I said, let me see, let me see, because I don't have a Facebook account. But I do do Instagram, I do do LinkedIn, and I go out there and I find some very interesting articles and things that uh, are good to read. So thank you guys. I won't hold you any longer. It's 1001. Enjoy your day. Stay safe. I got this one last thing to say. The 4th of July is coming up. Let your residents know what is acceptable on property as far as fireworks and what is not acceptable on property as far as fireworks. And we say this almost every year and we'll get a resident that gives us a call because they have gotten a write-up 
They didn't know that they couldn't do fireworks and shoot off all the rockets and entertain the kids on the neighborhood with the fireworks. So make sure you post something or send something in your newsletter to let them know what's accepted and what's not accepted. And you know the 4th of July weekend for our residents starts when? Most of them start Wednesday, even though it's not until Sunday, but they'll celebrate definitely from Thursday through Monday. And then I'll be laying in bed at my house and on Wednesday of next week, I'll hear firecrackers going off. So let them know what's acceptable and what's not. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and thank you for your input. It makes me feel good and makes me feel that it's worth my time. I hope it's worth yours. Have a great one and we'll see you soon next time. Thank you. All righty.